Kevin and I have had a long, um, long-standing interest in assisting every project in the industry, the purpose of which is to automate the understanding of the compliant flow of software. And what I have learned in all these years is that the biggest problem in dealing with copyleft from the very beginning has always been the problem of scale. Eben, Scott, and Terry will be talking about this issue um, after this panel. And uh, Karen Copenhaver will also be speaking about this basic point. But the idea is how to make compliance scale. And that is a process of taking it out of the word, world of disputing and putting it into the world of engineering. Um, we heard from Greg and Ted earlier from their point of view, the most important way is to explain it to the company what the rules are in terms of being compliant with copyleft. That's another way of making it scale. And now what I want to introduce here is how industry as a whole can teach the industry and the community as a whole how not to keep reinventing the wheel in their own silos, but enable a software supply chain where free software is delivered with trusted and consistent compliant information. It's a subject of much interest to the industry lawyers for a long time, and this was supposed to be a duet uh, between Eileen and Dave, who have been colleagues since Sun Microsystems, but Eileen has been uh, retained on the West Coast because of a business emergency, so um, Dave has the presentation with her name on it. <laughs> and um, I, in my own uh, lurking, non-business lower way, have been watching Open Chain progress. So what we wanted Dave and Eileen today to talk about was not a report not from a working group or compliance with a specification, but the philosophy behind Open Chain why it's important for supply chain and why it's so crucial for all the industry people who are interested in this to become a part of a system where there is effective management of free software for all the various moving paths. So here is uh, Dave Marr. Thank you, Dave, for joining us. Um, Dave Marr is the Vice President, Legal Counsel at Qualcomm Technologies, where he currently leads the open source practice and policy team. He manages a team of attorneys, engineers, program managers, and analysts to deliver strategic advice and support on community licensing practices. Also, thank you, Qualcomm, for lunch. <laughs> Dave writes and speaks regularly on FOSS related issues, their interaction with standard setting, technology transfer best practices, licensing business models, and other subjects at the intersection of law and high technology. Prior to Qualcomm, Dave previously worked at Sun Microsystems at various times supporting Java, Solaris, and Juniper networks. He's an attorney in good standing, admitted to practice in the state of California, and drives a Tesla. So here is Dave Marr. Thank you. That was overly kind, um, a little, little awkward for me, but uh, I appreciate it very much. Um, that. Uh, that you are not getting Eileen at this moment is, uh, is, is, is unfortunate in many ways, but uh, I will, and I know that I'm ripping you off because she's a terrific speaker, but she was really retained on some, uh, some um, last minute pressing emergencies on the West Coast. So um, why am I here, why am I talking to you? Open source compliance, it's, an, it's a topic that's very familiar to probably everyone here. Um, but if you don't mind kind of stepping into the mindset of of a company um, who's been, you know, kind of dealing with this stuff for a long time, the the paradigm is going to be probably a little different. So, uh, at its core, it's really simple stuff, right? It's you got to know your obligations and you got to satisfy them. Um, within an organization, there's all these different roles, there's functions, and so you have lawyers, of course, that get involved. But then to really understand what's in the bits. The engineers are the ones that have the subject matter, the domain expertise in that space. So that's about trying to distill what is inside of a product. But then when you are delivering that product, when you're satisfying those obligations um, for all that FOSS, then it's a multidisciplinary activity. Usually, ideally, lawyers get less involved. There's a little echo. I'm not sure if I, I need to hold it or if that's all right. Um, okay. 
So um, you have to have, of course, the engineers that know the code still involved, but then you have other disciplines also coming in. So things like product management. Um, and then if product management is different than the people actually pushing the bits out the door onto a website, into the product, then that's release management. Um, so all these folks that typically may not have ever been involved with the decision to do I write this code myself or do I bring it in from an open source project, that decision gets so far removed from the people that are actually delivering and satisfying these obligations. That is sometimes the sort of the, the roles issue that leads to sometimes well-intentioned um, uh, companies from actually stepping on their own toes. Okay, so these multidisciplinary things to satisfy what really is a very simple to express set of obligations. So what are these obligations? Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but it's the usual sus suspects. Attribution and notices, source code availability, uh, build scripts, you know, we talked about installation information. There's, so um, when do these happen? Typically, one of two triggers, distribution or modification. And if both, then almost certainly. So these are your typical FOSS obligations, and I'm not gonna sort of dwell into licenses unless there's really dedicated interest. I'm here to talk about ecosystem um, solutions. A common denominator across the board, company-wise, is you don't just try to focus on one product. You don't try to federate your compliance process. You actually end up having, you wanna have sort of a central owner of your open source compliance program. And if you have that, you know, then you can actually have stakeholders in different areas. But the overall policy itself needs to be driven by a central office. So that's enabling the effective usage of FOSS in these commercial products. But it's also about finding a way to make sure that the compliance piece is also met. But it all comes down to a central open source compliance program. Now, the hard stuff. Um, this, is a where, this is the area where it's really easy to make a mistake. Let me explain why. So sometimes when you're trying to identify the origin of these different pieces of FOSS, um, that meta information, it's so easy to get lost. It's downloaded by some person at some point in time, and there's all this Brownian movement that happens between the projects. In the native space, sometimes pedigree practices aren't really you know, what you would really want. Then within the company, you know, this code sometimes will morph into different forms, into different products, into different components. And so tracking FOSS software within the development process is not an easy thing, especially if you have different version control systems you know, in, in place by different groups. Uh, if the communication process between engineering teams is not robust, that tracking of FOSS software, the losing of good metadata information is very, very easy to, uh, to get lost. And then as you get closer towards release, you would perform this FOSS review, and then you would then identify these license obligations. But then a lot of times, you know, right before release, these are all, these, it's sometimes a heavy lift right before, you know, some deadline gets met. Um, and then when shipment happens, then you wanna make sure that the fulfillment of those obligations happen coincident with that distribution. And then stepping back overall, the program itself, you're gonna find issues where it's gonna be like, well, this process worked pretty well over here, could have improved it there. And so the improvement of the program itself needs to have its own feedback loop. And then the people that are actually delivering against this program they certainly need to be trained. Having a process, having a policy that's not well understood by the right people that need to follow it uh, is an easy area to overlook, and training is sometimes a key area where a lot of companies don't quite deliver all the way to the point where they need to in terms of getting everybody to understand their obligations internally. So, you know, that's sort of a compliance intro, um, but here's, uh, here's, here's where we have an opportunity as an industry. As an industry, we actually can 
start potentially using the information that's generated upstream, and instead of recreating it, we have an opportunity to streamline our distribution chain in terms of software. How do we do this? There's two pieces here. I'm here to talk about open chain and SPDX. One works hand in hand with the other. So who here has heard of SPDX? Just by a quick show of hands. That's, yeah, more than half the room, I think. Um, Software Package Data Exchange is what SPDX stands for, Software Package Data Exchange. So if I can start with SPDX. SPDX is like the lingua franca of potentially how you could take the attribution work that was done upstream and then bring it downstream so that it's immediately usable by people that use that software distribution. Today, okay, you know, um, NSPDX is still getting traction, still getting adoption, uh, but it is getting adoption in some key places. But today, without it, what happens is, um, you know, you would get software from, uh, a company would get software from another company that's upstream, and you would get some kind of long concatenated text file. And this long concatenated text file will perhaps note certain modules or packages or files, depending on however they decide to organize it. And they'll say, well, that's an association with this distribution that you just received. So how do you use that information? Because guess what? Most cases, your engineers, or oftentimes, they're going to take that package, they're going to subset it in, a, in the right way to actually build the product they're trying to build. So what happens is your, your meta information that is associated with it, it was never in a form that was actually that usable to you. And the, certainly the engineers aren't paying attention to that text file as they're refactoring that code. So that's one way not to do it. SPDX is a way that allows you to take that file. It's XML tagged with these fields. And so you can take that information, build it into your version control system, track it through a development process, build out that plumbing. And ideally, when when final product is extruded on the, on the other side, you can start delivering SPDX products, or sorry, SPDX attribution information to people downstream from you. So good things coming in can also result in good things coming out. So SPDX, okay, it's a, it's a common language for, for compliance for attribution purposes. There's other ways to do it. Um, the Debian project did some wonderful work um, and it's not SPDX, but it's they, the Debian project also built their own SPDX translator, so it actually maps their fields into SPDX. And I'm not saying there's other, there, there aren't other ways to do it as well, but there are now formats that are useful for preserving good compliance work done upstream and moving them down. But how do you know that the upstream compliance work was actually good. How do you, if I gave you today a perfectly formatted SPDX file, would you immediately trust it? Having no knowledge over the work process, what work process I went through, having no knowledge about the assumptions I went through, having no knowledge whether or not my engineers actually built that file even knew what open source was. The answer is, if I gave you that file today without any additional context, it would not be commercially reasonable for you to actually trust it. That's just, the, that's just the truth. So how do we solve that? Open Chain is a proposed specification for criteria around what would be a good consistent set of enterprise processes that scale both up to big companies and down to very small organizations for what would be hallmarks of quality as to the compliance artifacts generated as a result of that process. So think of it as like an ISO 9000, 9001. Oh, sorry, auto advance. I'll have to get through this slide quickly. So it's like an ISO process. Um, so it's conformity assessment. And think of it as a way to uh, identify these common 
I don't want to quite say best practices, you know, um, but call, let's call it good practices that can be used as a, as a good common denominator across multiple different organizations so that the redundancy that, uh, that's happening right now in the supply chain can be dialed down. If you're not redoing the compliance work that I already did and I'm in a position to pass that on to you to make your process more efficient, why not do that? So it's got six pieces to it. I'm gonna walk through it very quickly. So, auto advance. All right, so um, where does it start? It starts about, it's a very basic piece. How do you know that you have false responsibilities? Uh, you have to have a policy, and you have people that understand that policy, okay? So it's two things. Have a false policy, and a, have a false compliance education program, okay? The second criteria here, roles need to be defined. I'm gonna have that problem. Roles need to be defined where uh, there is this concept that we're trying to instill where we're calling it the FOSS liaison and then separate from that is a role of the FOSS compliance role. Why the difference? The FOSS liaison, if, if the community has an issue as to a compliance question around something that you're doing around a product or a service, give them a person they, they can talk to. Give them a way to, to start that conversation. So that's the external facing FOSS community liaison role. And then internally, the person in charge or the group in charge or the team in charge of the FOSS compliance process that should also be defined. We're not asking that list X, that, that, that team or that person to be externally published, unlike the FOSS liaison role. And by the way, in a lot of companies, it can be the exact same person, okay? There's no reason to have, you know, if you want it to be the same person, that's certainly possible. But we want to establish that these are actually two separate functions that are important to achieve good compliance. Third, the reviewing and approving of FOSS content. So if you have a um, FOSS procedure, it should do three things. It should identify, it should track, and archive the list of the identified FOSS, okay? Identify, track, and archive. And then as to the scope of the process that you have, it should be appropriate to the business that's in place. The FOSS review procedure, it must address the typical use cases that apply to that particular business. So if you never ship source, then you may not need a policy that addresses the, the, um, the, the, the source case model. If you're always shipping binaries, well, you're actually you're, you have a pretty high burden there, but you should be addressing those use cases that you're actually distributing against. If you're doing loadable kernel modules, you should have specific use cases that address that. But we're not here, as far as open chain goes, to, to tell you what your policy needs to say. We're saying your, sorry, your, review, your review, review procedure, it needs to address those use cases that matter to your business. I just sniff there, and you know, I'll be aware of my sniffing from now on. <laughs> so goal four. Uh, Deliver FOSS content documentation artifacts. So this is the obligation to satisfy those obligations, right? Uh, so, or so, sorry, satisfy those license requirements. So uh, in terms of how you do that, we're saying that there's this concept called supplied software. This is the stuff that's going out the door. As, in association with supplied software, there's this thing called distributed compliance artifacts. And based on the licenses that you chose to use, it could be notices, it could be source code, it could be written offers, it could be other things. It depends on the licenses that your engineering team chose to use. Now, community engagement was a topic of debate uh, at the um, at the open source, sorry, open chain work team level. Um, does does the interactive? Does the the participation in upstream communities, 
does it actually belong in the compliance aspect of the supply chain? For now, we believe it does, but it's an ongoing conversation. So it's in the current version of the spec, community engagement. So we're trying to not say, uh, in, in terms of for you to be compliant, we're not saying that you have to work upstream all the time. But if you have community engagement activity happening, then you should have a FOSS contribution policy that governs whatever the right outcome is for your organization. And if contributions are permitted, then there should be a process that governs such contributions. In other words, if engineers are working upstream and they are uh, committing, creating obligations on behalf of the company, the company ought to understand what those obligations are. Now, there's room here for a, for sort of a non-community-minded, non-good citizen, if you will, uh, practice here, which is, oh, we're not going to make any contributions at all. And we're not, and that doesn't violate open chain. But we actually are calling out, you know, that if there is community engagement happening, it should be understood. Now last, the last goal here is around the conformance. So if you have this, um, if you, you have a desire to express to people in your ecosystem, hey, you can trust my stuff uh, because I conform to the open chain criteria, then basically right now it's gonna be self-assertion. Uh, you affirm that your FOSS management program meets the criteria described in the specification. And we're actually putting up a server uh, at the Linux Foundation to um, allow people to register their conf conformance at that uh, open chain website. So these are the websites. Um, so version 2.1 of the SPX specification, it's at spdx.org. Uh, version one of the open chain spec is at openchainproject.org. And if you're not already involved in open chain, I do encourage really everyone here, please consider participating. Uh, we have an opportunity right in front of us to make a big difference. Um, I should add a couple things. One is that there's a curriculum that is in development, so it's actually very near final stage. So the curriculum work team has uh, put together a way for, even if you're a company that doesn't have any education program right now, we're giving you um, content that's available under the CC0 license for you to build out a program from that. And, you know, just, uh, you know, this is the SPDEX website, and this is the Open Chain Project um, website, They're both hosted at the Linux Foundation. And let me ask you this question. This last slide of mine says, Open Chain plus SPDX, the future ecosystem of open source, the future ecosystem of open source compliance. So, what is wrong with this slide, okay? Because I'm missing something, you know, I, I, it says actually too much. It overstates an issue, and I haven't talked enough about one core thing. I've talked about sort of the commercial supply chain, and this supply chain, you know, we're all kind of, um, in companies, we are the very understood beneficiaries of the terrific work product that's happening in the commons. In the commons themselves, in the, in the, in the wild world of active FOSS development, um, there's, you know, it's, it's, it's run by, on the, on the fuel of, of volunteers. And if you're, a, if you're writing co code and you're spending your nights and weekends, you know, writing code and in this social uh, coding pr you know, process, are you gonna spend time on the attribution information? How much focus, you know, is that, can that feasibly get? So that's one thing that I think is worth you know, further exploration, uh, in addition to others. But uh, that's, uh, that's where I think I'll, I'll pause my talk. Thank you very much. Let's, uh, let's talk about this more with people. Um, I, I, I am, uh, I, I'm grateful to Dave because um, uh, in this, as in so many other ways in our professional life together over the years, he, he, he plays it extremely straight, you know. 
Um, uh, what, 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 what I made this for, of course, was uh, to be a little bit more uh, hidden agenda about all of it. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm not exactly springing it on him. We all sat through all these conversations together planning this. But, but, but you will now see, um, I think, why I wanted this this afternoon to proceed the morning that we spent together. Um, we, are, we are going to move into a, 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 an era of software built around self-authenticating information made for sharing. Uh, and uh, that, that paradigm of software is made of free software. That is Bitcoin, Ethereum, all the uh, Hyperledger openness that we were talking about this morning. But it is also going to govern how we make software together. Lena spent a weekend once inventing something that changed the world. It's his second greatest invention. It is Git. Uh, and what it taught us was that uh, cryptographically authenticated tracking of the uh, changes made in distributed version control systems could produce uh, shareable, authenticated information, uh, which is software in the progress of being made. Uh, all of that information involves, as we discovered this morning, uh, a requirement of trust and a production of trust. And what I asked Dave to do in talking about OpenStack at the uh, 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 Open Chain at the conceptual level today was to express that this is a process by which trust is made. It's the required trust that enables further trust to be created. The crucial moment in Dave's talk from that point of, that, of that point of view is, OK, SPDX gives us an XML notation for explaining software origin and provenance and movement. Uh, but you couldn't really trust that SPDX if it didn't come from some place uh, that seemed to you to be trustworthy. How would we create enough social consensus to create trustworthy SPDX documents that could be passed around among people for the purpose of doing their clearance and compliance activity in commons. And what is so important about Open Chain is that it is an attempt to state, from my point of view, functionally, the minimum criteria for the availability of enough trust to turn that into self-authenticating information that can be shared. Making it self-authenticating is easy, put in a blockchain. <laughs> Making it shareable is not even easy. We do it already. The problem is we can't trust the information that we get from one another, and so we spend a lot of time remaking it, or we make mistakes, and then we have disputes that have to be adjusted. However, if we can establish the minimum social criteria for the creation of consensus, this is not a proof-of-work algorithm, but it's a proof-of-work standard. It says, you have to do this much work, and you have to do it in these ways, modulo what it takes to run your business, how many people you have, how it works, and it has to scale up or down. But it produces enough trust that we can share this information, which will authenticate itself as the information that exists on this subject. Everybody has seen it. Some people have modified it. Every modification is accounted for. And then Dave says, and remember, the community upstream is producing an enormous amount of this information. And it's produced by motivated volunteers. The reason we trust them is they work really hard to do this for nothing except the love of doing it. And Debian is indeed doing that. 34,000 and some packages wide, with every maintainer ultimately moving towards the machine-readable copyright file they've referred to, which can be automatically translated into the XML notation that other people downstream in commercial embedding and other uses want to apply. Several of us, Dave, Karen Copenhaver, me, all of us, we've spent now more than half a decade talking about how wonderful this would be to have. Uh, and we're getting closer to having it because the, the conditions for the creation of consensus about the quality of the resulting information, the consensus process we call open chain, is reaching maturity as is the notation that we call SPDX. And ultimately, notation plus trust will give us the ability to share self-authenticating information about free software and how it moves around in the world. The result should be compliance engineered in. And if that small number of companies around the world, and if you take the biggest supply chain managers in the industry, 
and you take any three out of the largest seven of them, they do business with more than 90% of all the suppliers that are relevant. Once we have consensus conditions for the creation of that information, we are ready for that next step, the technology of which we have been talking about this morning. I'm not prepared to tell you what the business models are for venture capitalists. I'm not prepared to tell you exactly how this fits into fintech. But what I am prepared to tell you is what Dave and his colleagues are working on at OpenChain is the beginning of the way we reduce the cost of compliance past the point of being negligible. Everybody learns, everybody does, the conditions of consensus create their own consensus for doing them, and suddenly we have a body of information available to us which can do this work for us and which the technology of self-authenticated sharing will make universal. That's the dream I believe we're sharing here. You want to tell me that I ca it can't be done, or that I'm wrong, or that really open chain is something else? No, that's, uh, to me that's spot on. Uh, the, the question is, you know, how do we expand the, the system, how do we make it better, and how do we build in, build in that self-authentication mechanism? So once we have the degree of consensus that we need, that we believe we can trust one another's uh, emissions of information on that subject, uh, I, 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 I do trust the Debian process. I trust it because it is so anarchistic and chaotic, but I also trust it because the consensus about how to do it is constantly evolving in a noisy democracy, where it is constantly under discussion, where improvements are constantly being made as a consequence of the debate and the discussion among the members of the Debian democracy who are doing that. That's open governance, as we were talking about it this morning. It isn't the only way that things work. And the importance to me of open chain is that it mediates between the public democratic ways of doing this and the intra-firm ways of doing this, which we don't have to control and which we don't want to get involved in. Decades ago, when I started making people f obey the rules of the GPL with Richard, when we had a problem, we went to companies and we said, we would really like you, as part of the settlement, to appoint a GPL compliance officer so that if we have any more trouble again, we'll know the phone number. This is the liaison function which Dave is talking about. It was always something that we needed in the aftermath of any major dispute with a company that we weren't sure had really understood its role. When we knew that they had understood, it was possible to have liaison. Everything that Dave is saying then leads back to education. How do you teach people how to do this? Now that, that's, a, that's a, a, a bush I've been around a number of different times over the last 25 years. What is the right way of teaching? The Free Software Foundation taught how to comply with licenses for hackers. The material published by FSF was by hackers, for hackers, and what it said was, you're a programmer, you make software, you want to apply the GPL, here's how you should do it, and you want to modify other people's GPL code, this is how you should do it. In the world where all we distributed was software, that seemed really good to me. Once people started embedding things in products, it wasn't enough anymore. Because you couldn't just go to people and say, you're doing it wrong, why don't you fix the bits? There were all those products out there in the world. And once each of those products out there in the world had 160 different pieces of software on it that came from 40 different suppliers, there's no hope anymore that talking to one firm at a time is really very valuable, which may also be why suing one firm at a time isn't really very valuable either. We're, we're, we're trying to spread responsibility, but it does come down to the teaching. Curriculum under development, how do you imagine it's being administered? How do you think open chain develops into an educational process? The curriculum piece, it's not necessarily a, um, a piece that open chain had to do. Uh, we could have just said um, there's a requirement to train your, your teams, your, your people involved in creating software products, train them on, on, on FOSS, and we could have left it there. Um, but then the reality is that you know, we want this spec to be successful. And we recognize that one big heavy lift for, especially for small organizations, is building out that curriculum. There's a couple pieces here. One is we want to make it super easy. If you want to be self-sustaining on your own curriculum and build it out, then 
we're putting out the curriculum under the CC0 license, it's, which is the choice that we had. It's the most permissive license we could potentially find. Um, you can take it. You can claim credit for it as your own and put it out, put your own company logo on it and just say, hey, hey boss, you know, look at what I wrote last night, okay? <laughs> Up to you. Um, so this curriculum is intended as, yeah, it would be a great potential thing to use out of the box, if you will, but you could also customize it and you probably should because you know, company processes tend to differ. So uh, it's a bootstrap mechanism to help people uh, get over the hurdle of how do I create my own curriculum. The other part is we're trying to build an ecosystem here. Uh, Evan, if I can indulge with a quick story. I was, you know, bef well before OpenChain, I was, I was uh, outside the U.S. working with a vendor that had compliance issues, and I was training them on FOSS compliance. I always had to train them on FOSS basics. I had to tell them, you know, what these licenses were, you know, that they were using. Um, unbeknownst to the management. And I'm thinking, I'm gonna walk away from here. I know this particular vendor works with a number of different other companies, and if they're delivering the same kind of compliance artifacts to me that they're, they're delivering to these other companies, they're gonna come in, because I know that they have ways to check on this stuff, and they're gonna probably wanna have the same conversation. Why should it be the, the people downstream training the people upstream? Why can't it just be an ecosystem where there's available resources we're now, we're now decades into this so-called movement. We are now, I think, at a point where we're beyond just a movement. We're, 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 it's time for us to grow up. And the ecosystem, I think, at this point is super healthy. There's a lot of people with deep expertise that can be consultants, that can do the training and come in as third parties to supply these pieces, whether it's process design, open source training, or helping people get to the conformance process. So the answer is that what we're really doing is hoping that people will deliver curriculum themselves better. We're providing free shareable information that helps them to train people. And we're hoping that over the long haul, uh, instead of uh, uh, down, downstream disciplining upstream, it's upstream learning for itself. Um, when we do that, we also want to be making better tools. We also want to be automating more. We want to be enabling everybody to spend less time on this and more time making software. I, I assume that the tooling is, from my point of view, the crucial part. I don't do compliance investigations. Compliance investigations do themselves. Software complains when it isn't compliant, if you like. And that's because it is based upon a thorough and complete understanding of the transactions that have gone on in the world that made that software before. Um, this, this, of course, could be turned into smart contracting. That is to say, what we're really talking about is compliance tooling is becoming smart contracts on top of shared authenticated information built by people who are trustworthy in a network of partners. I'm, I, 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 I know that this amounts to a vision, right? Um, uh, but, but, but surely it also amounts to a great and important business opportunity. Um, there, there's no way, right, that we're all going to scale all these businesses all around the world, taking all stuff from Bulgaria and Sweden and China and India and the Maldives all together and making this work unless we have something like that, right? And it, it needs to be driven by people that are involved and attend peace, you know, conferences like this. This is where it needs to happen. Now, now QTI is a custom builder in a way. Uh, but it, of course, doesn't build all its own stuff. There isn't any vertically integrated party in the world anymore. How does QTI see the benefit that it derives from this over the long haul? Yeah, it, great question. It has been a substantial effort to try to get this back and get OpenChain uh, to this point. OpenChain stands on the shoulders of the prior work already done by the SPDX team. Um, but over time, the idea is that um, efficiency, there's going to be, this, this ought to just pay for itself. The efficiency, the cost savings, as easy as it is to download software off the internet, um, the compliance activity ought to become automatic muscle memory and just as easy because the metadata should be always readily available so that the compliance work can be done. And maybe it's tooling, maybe it's smart contracting, um, but uh, there's, a, there's a huge opportunity for automation 
the major breakthrough that we're trying to make here is before um, you had the instincts of a lawyer to not share anything, okay? If I told you nothing about you know, the compliance work I did, it actually makes me feel the best because chances are um, you know, there's gonna be something in there that's not gonna be pristinely perfect. And for us to be able to say, okay, let's start biasing towards um, cooperation. Let me share enough so you can start trusting the data. It's basically lawyers emulating what already works in the FOSS model. Some years ago, we had a, a, a problem with a very large company whose name I don't need to offer because it, we don't have a problem anymore. But we spent an awfully long time in fix a bug, make a bug compliance condition. And we would get one product fixed and then something else would turn up and people would say, yeah, well, there are a lot of business units in our company and you know they don't all get on the same page at the same time. But after one particular problem in which um, there really was GPL software unacknowledged right in the middle of one of the company's flagship products and we said, we don't want to kill you, we just want you to fix this forever now, please. Uh, a wonderful engineering occurred within the company and wonderful compliance uh, structures were generated and an enormous enterprise which had had a lot of trouble doing it right suddenly was doing it right all the time. And, and, uh, and the team that had done this won the great big internal annual best engineering in the company this year prize and everybody was extremely happy and I went to them and said, you know, you, you guys are really good at spinning off businesses. Why don't you spin this off? Why don't you make this available to everybody now that you have done it and make money with it in the industry? And people said, yeah, we thought about it. But we decided that now that we're really so good at compliance, it's an enormous competitive advantage and we're not going to tell anybody <laughs> anything about it. Um, and that's the ecosystem that Dave is talking about and that's how it failed. And, it, it, and, and the better people got at it, the more possible it was for it to fail because the more they had decided that they had climbed a, a steep hill and they really shouldn't give away gravity on how they got there. Um, I, we're not going to let that happen anymore. This is not going to occur anymore. In the same way that free software said there's no vertically integrated software businesses in the world anymore, we are not vertically integrating compliance. We are ecologically generating the engineering necessary to spread compliance everywhere to the edge, and we're using the power of supply chain management to do it. I think this is correct. So when Dave says everybody ought to be part of open chain, I'll go even a little further and say you're going to be part of it. The question is whether you're going to be in early or in late. And it's all going to be there and it's all going to be one great big distributed ledger you need to be part of. You will be part of it. You will be partnered with it. Um, let's do it right the first time. Uh, unlike all the stuff we were talking about this morning, we're not going to destroy finance capitalism if there's a bug in it. Uh, we're just going to get better compliance eventually after we fix the bug. But this is a wonderful test case for us of how we're going to use the style of software that is the most important one in the future because it is our stuff. We're going to perfect using and distributing and we're going to perfect doing that at the lowest possible cost by adroit and intelligent sharing. And if you don't mind my saying so, now we should ask people to ask us some questions. Um, because this is what they really want to ask about, I think. Karen Copen. Well, I, I just, one, I want to give uh, Dave a huge hats off for the work that he's done here, because bringing everybody together, um, I mean, just in terms of that training, no one company wants to put their training out. Sometimes they think it's a competitive advantage. Sometimes they're worried about liability by coming together and putting the community together. You know, you made it possible for people to share these things. And, and the work that's been done, I have so enjoyed watching all these new people come into the community and the education that has occurred as they've been developing these processes among the people who participate is, is just awesome. Um, but I'm gonna put one more plug in as to why I think that this is going to become you know, important very quickly. And that is that uh, you know we're, we are improving open source all the time. Uh, we have the core infrastructure initiative that's focused on security of you know basic elements in the stack, 
And you know, companies are becoming much more interested in versions of what version of the software you are using so that they know that you have an ability to update and to be up to date on the patches. That information needs to be provided that's, that's current and not you know, a one-time file that's in the back of the, of the you know, uh, folder in the lawyer's cabinet, but that travels with the software and is updated. So I th it's another driver to make this um, automatic. But hats off, and, and Eben, you have been so supportive of both SPDX and Open Chain, and we couldn't have launched them without that support and guidance, so I just wanted to say thanks. Well, I was sitting, uh, I was sitting in San Diego in the Qualcomm building with Dave, sitting by some, uh, some vending machines one day, and he was saying to me, we're going to do this, aren't we, and here's how it should work, and, and I, I, I was impressed with the daring of it, I have to admit. I thought, man, you get all those people into this, and you get all that supply chain organized this way, yeah, you will, you will take over the world. I, 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 I hope you can do it, and, and, and he's done it. Um, and and, and that, that is, I must say, a very impressive achievement. Making software uh, is, is really, really hard, but smart people can do it. Uh, social engineering at this level is extremely difficult indeed. Uh, it's all those squishy bags of water Greg was talking about. It, 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 even C is less squishy than that. Uh, and and, and, and it, is, uh, it is the hardest part. The, the hard stuff, as Dave says, is, is really the getting people organized and getting everybody on the same foot about how we make information other people can trust. I do think we've climbed over the hump that everybody understands why trusting one another is critically important and saves a ton of money. Uh, and therefore, I think we're now down to the how rather than the why. Uh, and from there to the end, it ought to be a, a, a not smooth sailing, but a man who can get us as far as we've gotten so far can get us the rest of the way. Uh, other people want to ask questions about all this? Well then, thank you was the correct place to stop. <laughs> <laughs>